Hello, this is State Representative Robert Martwick, and I'm coming to you here from my district on the northwest side of the city of Chicago with another episode of Straight Talk Common Sense Solutions. This is my little Facebook Live video series where I try and break down the state issues, the things, the problems that we're facing and the potential solutions, and do it in a way that is at least somewhat factual. To be fair, I, I, I have my own opinions on things and they will come through this, uh, but you're, you're, you're always welcome to agree or disagree, make some comments, ask some questions. I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, today we're going to talk about education funding. So just when you thought we passed a budget and we got everything done in Illinois, comes along education funding. And we've got another impasse. Imagine that the legislature and the governor at impasse. And, and this is equally as important as the state budget. So when we passed the state budget, we passed a provision in there that said we would only spend education dollars, state education dollars, if we did it through the implementation of a new funding formula. And since we haven't agreed on that formula, we're back at this impasse. And it has some very negative consequences, right? Because if we don't pass this formula, if we don't make an agreement on this formula, then of course funding, state funds won't get distributed from school to schools and of course for schools that are that, that rely heavily on state funding this will cause a lot of harm and potentially uh, a shutdown of school in the middle of the school year. Imagine schools starting up and then having to close while we fight out this battle on which way we should go about distributing money. So let's, let's start out with a little background. School funding in Illinois, right? So, this is a little history to help you understand how we got to this place in the first place. Number one, Illinois is last in state funding for education. That's right, 50 states in the union, and of all the 50 states, Illinois ranks dead last in terms of how much we support education. That means our local school districts are highly reliant upon local property taxes, which is fine if you have a big valuable property tax base. If you don't, then there's not much you can get out of that. And as a result, we get a large disparity in total education funding. So there are poor school districts that provide, they put much less money into educating their children than do the very wealthy school districts. And therefore, we have a very inequitable system of education. Who agrees with this? Everyone. That's right, the governor, the legislature, everybody agrees that, that our, our, our system of funding schools is inequitable and therefore we have children that aren't getting the same opportunities as others and we think that's wrong. Why not change the formula? Well, that's what we're trying to do. And in the past, this has been a discussion, topic of discussion for years, the reason we didn't change the formula is because it creates winners and losers, right? If you change the way that you spend money, that means you're taking from some to give to others. And that might be more fair, but when you're dead last in the country in terms of funding education, it's awful hard to tell somebody that even though we barely give you anything, we need to take some of that away. So even the school districts that are doing well and might not need it as much still say, wait a minute, this isn't fair. So there's good news. The good news is in this budget, we added $350 million of additional funding to schools. And that's great, because with $350 million, if we change the formula, we can do it in such a way so that no one loses. No one gets less money in 2018 than they got in 2017, 16, and previous, right? And the school districts that need more money to provide a better education for their children because they're poor will get additional money through a change in the formula. Number two, there is wide agreement on the formula. That's great. The actual formula for the way that we spend money, there is wide agreement. This is called an evidence-based model. And I'm not going to go into the details of it because it's very complicated. But there is agreement between Democrats, Republicans, even the governor agrees that this is the way to get things done. That's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, once again, Chicago pops into the scene. And there is disagreement on how to handle the Chicago public schools. Why is that notable? Because for years... The Chicago public schools have been handled very differently than other school districts, and that's important to note as we move forward. So let's start out with a background on Chicago public schools. 
Chicago, there are two separate pension plans in the state of Illinois that deal with teachers. All the Chicago teachers go to the Chicago Teacher Pension Fund. All the rest of the teachers in the state go to the teacher's retirement system. Two separate pension funds. Why is this important? Well, let's talk about the way that schools are financed. So let's start out with all schools except Chicago. This is important. Every school in our state except Chicago. For their day-to-day -day operations, they fund them with a combination of local, local property taxes and state money, right? Local property taxes and state money. The pensions for every other school district except for Chicago, state funds. The state funds come from income taxes, which come from every citizen in Illinois. So let's just take, for instance, a suburb. I'll randomly pick Schaumburg, okay? Very nice place. Um, so their pensions are paid for by income taxes from residents from Schaumburg and re residents from every other part of the state, including residents of the city of Chicago. Why is that important? Well, let's talk about Chicago public schools. Their operations are also funded by local property taxes and state funds, just like every other school district. But here's where it changes. The pensions for Chicago teachers are paid for by local property taxes. That's not how the other teachers' pension funds are paid for. And who pays local property taxes? Chicago residents only. So think about this. Both systems have a great deal of debt. And in order to get out of that debt, people are going to have to pay taxes. So who's going to pay to fix all of the pension systems or the pension systems for all the teachers in the state other than Chicago? Everyone is. That means people from all over the state, including people from Chicago, are going to fix the teacher funds, teacher pension funds, for the rest of the teachers in the state. Who's going to fix the Chicago pension problem? Only the residents of Chicago. So we pay twice in Chicago what everybody else in the state is only paying once. So keep that in mind as we move forward to SB1. SB1 or the governor's plan for fixing education funding. SB1 is the plan that was passed by the legislature, both chambers, who went to the governor's desk and he vetoed it. And that is what results in the governor's plan. So I'm going to give you a brief update about what the difference is between these two plans. Let's start out with SB1. SB1, and, and they both distribute money through the formula the same way with one difference, how we treat Chicago schools. Okay, SB1 includes the normal cost of pensions for Chicago public schools. This is important. Why? Because this makes the Chicago public schools treated like every other school district in the state. Every other school district in the state, who handles the normal cost of their pensions? The state does. This is going to now shift the normal cost of the pensions to the state as it should be, so that Chicago public schools and Chicago teacher pensions are treated the same. Normal cost, though, here is important. This is what the cost is going forward, right? But SB1 also accounts for the unfunded pension liability. Remember, both systems have debt. Income taxes are going to pay back the rest of the teachers in the state. What are we going to do about the pension liability in Chicago? It's a roughly the same sort of unfunded percentage, right? They're both about half funded. So what this does is this says, SB1 says, look, we're not going to pay back the Chicago teacher pension unfunded liability, their pension debt. But what we're going to do is we're going to accept the fact that Chicago has a cost that they have to pay back for their pensions that was largely created by the fact that the system was not put up right. And it's going to roll that into the formula that's going to give them additional money to account for the fact that they have an additional expense every year. They have a debt payment every year that other school districts do not, even though they both have debt to pensions. What this does is this treats CPS the same as every other district in the state. It puts it on parity. And this is important. Let's talk about the governor's plan. What's the difference in the governor's plan? It does not account for the CPS pension debt. Okay. As the governor has been one to say, this is a bailout for Chicago. He loves to say that, bailout for Chicago. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So what he's saying is, no way I'm not paying for CPS pension debt. I'll, I'll pay for everybody else's pension debt, but not CPS's. Okay. This would directly take massive amounts of money out of CPS classrooms. Why? Remember, when we give money to education, it's all one dollar, okay? And 
CPS is going to have to make pension payments no matter what. So if we reduce the amount of money that Chicago gets, because we're not going to account for the fact that they have a large pension debt, then they will have to make that pension payment anyway, and the money that will get shorted will be the money that was dedicated for the classroom. This would directly affect Chicago school children, giving them a lower quality of education than every other district in the state. And this is important. Under the governor's plan, under the SB1, no one loses money. Everyone is at the same or better than they were before. Under the governor's plan, only one district in the school in the state loses money. Only one school district in the entire state loses money, Chicago Public Schools. Roughly, under the governor's last calculation, $145 million a year. So, let's talk about the Chicago bailout. Well, this was just recently done. Uh, the, the, the governor's widely been traveling around the state, not in Chicago, mind you, but every other part of the state saying that everyone should oppose this because it's a bailout for Chicago and he's not going to bail out Chicago and he's going to stick it to Chicago. Well, the Better Government Association and PolitiFact, which is a nonpartisan political fact checker, said that, um, that uh, they looked into this claim and they said unequivocally that the SB1, our plan for funding education, is not a Chicago bailout. Why? Because of what I just told you. It puts Chicago on the same basis as everyone else. It makes sure that everyone gets more money, not less money, and uh, so it's not a Chicago bailout. So that, that should be just, we should be done with that. I wish the governor would be done with it. So let's talk about this. This is important. Who supports SB1? And let me tell you, one of the first things I, I've learned, and this is something I talk about on these videos all the time, we have a citizen legislature. And what this citizen legislature is means that Anyone gets to serve, right? Anyone is eligible to serve in the Illinois legislature, which means we have a wide variety of people from all sorts of different backgrounds and, of course, all different corners of the state, as it should be. But that means, really, there are very few people that are ever an expert on any issue. And that's important. As a legislator, you want to know, where do the experts weigh in on this? And so people do. They, they file in as proponents or opponents of bills. I think it's important that you listen to experts, right? Uh, I'll give you a quick story. When I was first elected in 2012, I had a whole group of environmentalist experts uh, come to me to talk to me about fracking, who uh, the, the Sierra Club, the Illinois Envir uh, Environmental Council, the National Research Defense Council. So they come and they say, we want to talk to you about fracking. And I said, well, I assume you're against it. And they said, no. We're actually for the bill that expands fracking because we were able to negotiate really tight restrictions, and therefore we think that this is a good bill and you should support it. Well, I would have thought they would have been against it, but it's good to listen to experts because they know more than you do. So what do all the experts on education funding say? Statewide School Management Alliance, Advance Illinois, Chicago, uh, excuse me, the uh, Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, Ounce of Prevention, Teach Plus Illinois, Illinois Action for Children, Stand for Children, and Funding Illinois' Future, and others. What do they all say? SB1. Not only that, we heard from school administrators that were from downstate, downstate, who came and testified before the House and said, support SB1. And the question is asked, why would you support SB1 if you might get more money for your school district under the governor's plan? And the answer was, from all of these people, is that we care about properly educating children all children in the state of Illinois. And no one with a conscience could say, let's do better for our children by really taking away money and resources from other children who need it. They supported SB1. All of these people support SB1. So then the question becomes, well, which experts, which organizations, which groups support the governor's plan? You got it, folks. Nobody supports the governor's plan, except the governor. Now, I know the governor is a very successful person. Clearly, he's made a lot of money. He's very good at making money. We can all agree on that. But last I checked, despite a very strong interest in education, just like I have, he's not an expert in education funding. None of the experts agree with him. And that's why we support SB1. Now we're at this impasse. Now we're stuck with a veto that we're going to have to attempt to override. 
if we're unable to override it and we're unable to agree to pass the governor's version, we could be in big trouble in the state. And, and here's the problem. This is now going to get directly to the children of the state of Illinois and deny them educational opportunities. Days lost in the classroom are very hard to make up. Oh, you can make up one or two, just like a snow day. But once you start closing for a couple weeks at a time, those kids will never catch up. And they'll be behind every other kid in every other state as they try and compete to get into colleges and universities. This is something we shouldn't be doing. At some point, you have to realize Maybe you haven't got it figured out, and maybe you should listen to the experts. That's why I support SB1, and that's why I think it's the right path forward. It treats everybody equally. It makes sure no one loses. It makes sure that all of our children, especially those that are in poverty-stricken areas, have an opportunity to get a decent education in the state of Illinois, and that's what we should be looking to achieve. So that's it. That is my update on SB1. Um, now that the governor has issued his veto, we're waiting to be called back to Springfield where we'll attempt an override vote. Um, I hear rumors that the Senate will uh, take up this vote in perhaps uh, two weeks, and then we will take it up uh, sometime after that, hopefully shortly after that. The sooner we can do this, the better. I hope that we're successful um, and that we can get this done. One way we could get it done is for those of you who have been watching this, if you reach out to some Republican legislators and tell them that this is important that we get this done and that you ask them that they should. Uh, the governor, if enough people get to him, he could allow his Republican uh, legislators to override his own veto if he could be convinced that this was the right path forward. That's what we should be doing right now. That's what I'm focused on doing. I hope you'll join me. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please uh, feel free to... Uh, to uh, leave them here on Facebook and I'll do my best to get back to them in time. And until next time, thanks for watching.